so the duty to avoid conflicts of interest, let's just keep this with us for a minute. You've got my slides, but we don't need to look at them for a minute. So a lawyer shall not act or continue to act for a client where there is a conflict of interest, except as permitted under the rules in this section. So it's kind of similar to confidentiality, right? There's a prohibition with exceptions, same as if we imagine with conf confidentiality, you know, you, you can't, you're prohibited from disclosing, but for exceptions. So, and then you, you, it's, I just think it's important to read all this stuff and to spend some time here. It's all here, but it takes us, it refers to the definition. It parses the definition. Um, it talks about personal interest conflicts. It talks about current client conflicts. It talks about former client conflicts, conflicts deriving to other people and other issues to consider. I mean, I think it's really, it's a helpful rule because it follows the definition in the way we just went through it. So I recommend that you look at it, okay? Um, the, the case law that drives a lot of this in case people are keeping track or are interested, the used to be a trilogy. Now it's essentially three plus one. There's, there's basically four, four cases. Um, is the uh, the four cases are the McDonald State and Martin case, often called Martin and Gray, Supreme Court of Canada. Then the R V Neal case, N E I L, Supreme Court of Canada, Justice Binney. Uh, there's the Struther case, uh, which deals with former clients, Supreme Court of Canada. And then the most recent case is the McCurcher case, M C K E R C H E R, out of Saskatchewan, the McCurcher law firm. Supreme Court of Canada. The bright line, and so the so the the, the basic premise, and now I'm going to come back to my slides. I've shown you. So the, the rule talks about the prohibition with exceptions. The commentary then takes you through those various aspects of the definition of what it means. I, re I, re I recommend that you read it, some other issues to consider. And then it gets into consent. What can consent do for you? And when can you consent and not consent um, to getting around uh, um, um, uh, sorry, to getting around a conflict of interest? Um, and then it talks about uh, when when a lawyer is uh, um, in when a client's in a dispute with another with another client and what that means. So some of the tough stuff is around what can consent do for you and when does it mean you're in a in a dispute? And Consent in the bright line that I'll come back to, but just because I've got it up here, the bright line rule referred to in the commentary um, uh, does not apply in circumstances where it is unreasonable for a client to expect the law firm will not act. No issue of consent arises in such circumstances. So we'll come back. We'll come back. That, that that's really the McCurcher case, and it's um, and it's looking um, uh, at the idea of of trying to balance all conflicts versus material conflicts or whether the client is really trying to freeze out a lawyer and, and essentially pretending there's a conflict where there really isn't one. And so there's trying to balance this. Um, so, uh, and then 3.4-3. And then so let me leave this now and come back to the slides. Um, and again, I'll just ask for your uh, confirmation that I've got the right thing in front of us. Okay, so conflicts of interest, the, the Eman slides, both sides of a dispute. So really where we're at is 3.4-3. So it says, just the, the rule says, despite rule 3.4-2, which is despite the consent rule, okay? And you've just read, uh, not now, but I know you will have read the consent rule. A lawyer, this is what, I'm just quoting the rule. A lawyer shall not represent opposing parties in a dispute. So what that says is despite the ability to get consent, a lawyer shall not represent opposing, opposing parties in, dis, in a dispute. So um, the, con the kind of context here is let's imagine a high conflict family law case where you've got spouse A and spouse B in litigation, in the courtroom, One's on the left side of the courtroom, one's on the right side of the courtroom. It's hard to imagine a case where the lawyer, one lawyer could stand up for client A and in a loyal, competent way, argue the case for client for spouse A, sit down, walk across the aisle, stand up, and then argue the case for spouse B. 
You just can't do it in a loyal, competent way. So that is the, that's a classic quintessential example of a dispute where notwithstanding, even if spouse A and spouse B consent, the lawyer cannot uh, represent opposing parties in a dispute. And it's called, that's what's called the bright line rule. Um, it's featured, for example, from Justice Binney in the R.V. Neal case. Um, and it basically is a prohibition because it says the lawyer shall not. So here is, you can imagine drafting an exam questions that says, with consent, a lawyer may represent people on the other, uh, sorry, a lawyer shall not represent clients on the other side of a dispute, comma, unless consent of, uh, you know, unless consent is given by both parties uh, having received independent legal advice. You could imagine that kind of short, what looks kind of reasonable, but it's, it's, the answer is false because of rule 3.4-2, and that's why, okay?